My name is Luke Smithuja. I'm Trace Piatti. I'm Wesley Chris Lapp, and as Dr. Trace said, we'll be testing with fish solution and multivitamins to verify by vitamin nice amounts using high forms liver cream tart. So today we'll be talking about multivitamins in, in general, and then we will be discussing the specific B vitamins we focus on in this experiment. And then we'll talk about the instruments we used and finish up with the results and discussion. So um, uh, dietary supplements are growing uh, more and more popular in, in America. Uh, roughly 63% of the population uses some sort of dietary supplement with multivitamins being the most popular. Uh, this is despite the fact that uh, around 10% of the population has some, some sort of actual vitamin deficiency. So um, there's actually a lack of FDA regulation on multivitamins. Uh, in general, uh, they they don't test to see the exact concentrations of certain vitamins. Rather, they just uh, ensure that there are no adverse side effects once the uh, dietary supplements go on the market. So we decided to uh, test a generic and a uh, brand name multivitamin, and um, they have the exact uh, same number of labeled uh, niacin and riboflavin, and they also have comparable um, vitamins elsewhere. And as Luke said, the vitamins we decided. To uh, focus on our niacin and riboflavin, and this is the structure of niacin. We specifically focused on niacin, right, because there's two parts of the niacin chemical, and then riboflavin. And in the body, they're broken down into the coenzymes NAD and ADP, and FMN, FMN and FAD. And coenzymes are organic substances that help proteins function when they're needed. And these proteins are involved in oxidation reactions or energy metabolism at the cellular level. So the, the reason why we're doing this experiment is because these vitamins need to be accurate on the label because if there's a deficiency or an overdose, that causes complications. For example, niacin, if there's a deficiency, your condition known as pellagra, which causes swelling of the mouth, nasal cavity, also you can experience psychosis. And if you have too much niacin, it acts as a vasodilator, which causes flushing, your blood vessels expand, and all the side effects um, incorporated with decreased blood pressure are present. And riboflavin, if there's a deficiency of that, then the iron in your body and your bloodstream won't be able to use, be used and converted by the body, so you're just free-floating iron, which can cause other complications, such as diseases. But too, mi too much riboflavin isn't a bad thing because that's just excreted through urine. So that's why the labels need to be accurate for these two vitamins. So to first test for vitamins, we needed to dissolve them in solutions. So we used to paddle the solution at first. So this is basically in vitro testing, which is in the lab. And uh, it comprises of six uh, vessels in which uh, they are all heated by water, water breath, um, usually for our experiment at 37 degrees Celsius. And uh, it's designed to provide six almost identical conditions so that the only variable in there is, to, is the pill itself. And uh, you have paddles that spin at 75 RPM for our experiment to help facilitate uh, dissolution. And so we used two types of pills, uh, the gener generic and the name brand. So we had three vessels for the generic brand and three vessels for the name brand. And we extracted the uh, samples after one hour with a syringe and cannula. And then after the samples were taken out of the dissolution apparatus, we needed to separate them through high performance liquid chromatography. Because if we, they, all these vitamins absorb at a similar wavelength of 275 nanometers. And if we didn't put it through this machine and we just put it straight, to the UV detector, there'd be one massive absorption peak because all the vitamins are stacked on top of each other and those peaks combine. But what high performance liquid chromatography does, there's two solvents, acetonitrile nitrile and water. They go through a pump and pick up the injection sample, which was got, which was taken from the dissolution apparatus. And then they're moved, that's called the mobile phase, and then they're moved through a HPLC column. And the column for reverse phase liquid chromatography, what we used, is nonpolar, while the solvents are polar, so the more polar the vitamin is, the faster it will elute through the HPLC column, while the more non-polar it is, it will stick to the column and take longer for it to move through. So that's why once it reaches the detector, there's individual peaks, so we can examine each multivitamin individually rather than having one massive absorption. As you can see here, this is how the peaks would appear at different retention times as they come through the machine. So uh, this is an example. This is a standard we ran. A standard is basically we took pure niacinamide and pure riboflavin and uh, put it into our 0.1 molar HCl uh, dilute. And um, we saw that we could, we could, using this, we could tell where the niacinamide and the riboflavin are. And then we later use this to, um, to find the standard curve to help us solve for the masses of each multivitamins. 
So using the absorbances gained from the standards, we ran four standard concentrations. We ran 12.5%, 25%, 50%, 100%. And we found the absorbances for each riboflavin and niacin and plotted them in a scatter plot. And using some statistical analysis, we found the line of best fit. And using that model, we can create a ratio to find the concentrations of unknown uh, samples. So then this was an example of chromatogram from our dissolution apparatus. This was the first trial of multivitamin 1 and the first trial of multivitamin 2, with multivitamin 1 being the generic. And after we ran the standards, we were able to tell the retention times of niacinamide and riboflavin, so we knew what time they came out. And once we got those peaks, we were able to measure absorption, and that can be using that, using this standard curve, absorption can be converted down to concentration. So uh, over here we took the, the averages of the absorptions of uh, each three samples um, for both multivitamins and the time. And so uh, using the ratio, uh, we could find the concentration and then from there find the mass. Uh, the labeled claims for the niacin were 20 milligrams and 1.7 riboflavin. And our multivitamins came out pretty much similar. There was 19.89 milligrams of niacin, and two, but 2.5 milligrams of riboflavin, which was a lot more, and similar results for the, for the multivitamin. So multivitamin 1 and multivitamin 2 both had very accurate niacin. 99.5% uh, and 98.7% accuracy respectively compared to the labeled amounts. And this is important because niacin does have issues with both overdoses and uh, deficiencies. So it's very important that it's accurate. Riboflavin on the other hand was almost 50% over for both multivitamin 1 and 2. Uh, now, this is not an issue because most of the, ribo most of the excess riboflavin is just excreted through urine. Um, and generic versus brand name, as you can see, there is not much difference. Both, ni both the niacin and riboflavin concentrations in both of the generic and the name brand are very similar. And if we had more time in future experimentation, we could use more standards. In the past one, we just used 12.5, 25, 50, and 100. We plot six points now to get a better line of best fit. We'd also do multiple dissolutions. We only had time to do one, three of each pill, but we do m multiple dissolutions, more of each pill to eliminate sources of error. We do variant pHs to test different, how the pill dissolves in different body systems, such as the mouth, the stomach, and the small intestines. And in our experiment, we only able to test the pills dissolving in the stomach. And we'd also do more multivitamin brands and types, because we only did one generic and one brand name, but we do more of each, and also more lots or more batches of each vitamin to see how the same company, how each lot varies in concentrations. And lastly, we use an auto sampler HPLC instrument because we had to inject our samples by hand every 30 minutes, and by using an auto sampler, we would do other stuff while this is going on, and also it eliminates human error, so it's more accurate for results. So in conclusion, uh, we used, uh, we dissolved multivitamin tablets in conditions similar to human body. Uh, three samples of each type of multivitamin were used, were run through HPLC to determine the mass of niacin and riboflavin, which have effects uh, depending if it's too much or too little. And uh, overall, we found that there was a little bit more riboflavin, but it doesn't really matter, and niacin was uh, pretty accurate. So this could, what we did could lead to a more effective ver verification method of the vitamins, and also uh, hopefully more accurate labels um, in the future. So we'd like to thank ECU Summer Ventures and Dr. Mr. Sean Moore for funding us with the, for this project, and uh, Dr. Carter, David, uh, David Farrell, and Alyssa Jackson for helping us and guiding us through this project. And uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Jack Pender and Dr. Keith Holmes for allowing us to use their dissolution apparatus, and Dr. William Allen and Dr. Colin Burns for uh, lending us the HPLC device. And uh, finally, Dr. Lo Brian Love for providing us with the organic chemical. So is there any questions before we conclude on the experiment? Yes, sir. Well, I, I guess uh, the sample size is way too small to make many conclusions, but it looks like, based on what you've said, uh, that the uh, manufacturers t pay a whole lot more attention uh, to the amount of niacin in their product yes. because of the concerns that you mm -hmm. mentioned. How do they control? How do they control the amount of niacin and the amount of riboflavin that they have in their uh, multivitamin? I think it's generally based in the manufacturing of the product. Um, when they manufacture it, they have to have the certain amounts of niacin and riboflavin in there. The FDA does not uh, regulate the 
production of vitamins, they only regulate it after it's on the shelf. So if someone has, like, if someone gets really sick after the product's on the shelf, then the FDA will, FDA will step in and see how the vitamin companies are making their vitamins. So perhaps the manufacturers test during the manufacturing process more for the niacin than to do the riboflavin? Yeah, probably. And I think they use a similar method as we did, using HPLC and the solution. And then also the riboflavin, since there's not as much adverse effects, if there's an overdose, the often vitamin companies will put more in than the vitamins to ensure the label amount is met because the, the, there's not a problem if there's too much for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yes, Liz. Did y'all look into the possibility that another vitamin could have been co-leading with the riboflavin and getting any exaggerated results? Yeah, it could have been. If there, because we try to run through the HPLC to get the individual piece, but because riboflavin has a poor solubility, it's, it was actually really good that it had a, such a good absorption rate, so there could have been another peak under that that came out at the exact same time that could have caused um, higher riboflavin amounts than expected. Future testing will be a figure it out. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you, guys. You